You're watching Telecom TV from the Smart IoT London event 2016. And I'm joined now by Ben Ward, who is CEO of Flood Network. Ben, thanks for talking with us on, on Telecom TV. Um, tell me about the Flood Network and, and, and what it is you're, you're, you're hoping to achieve. So Flood Network is a set of low-cost sensors uh, that can be installed. They're about an order of magnitude cheaper than the existing ways of sensing floods. Um, they can be installed under bridges, uh, in overhangs, back gardens, and they can actually increase the detail of water levels and information about flooding. Um, so that started as a project that was uh, for individuals to join, communities, and became something that actually is useful to local authorities. And there's an interesting hybrid there where the local authorities can use uh, crowdsource sensing uh, to augment what they already do. So I have some background, uh, especially in the UK, it was a global thing, but in the UK especially we're, we're seeing more, um, an increase in, 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 I guess, water levels and the problems that, that, that floods cause and that has a knock on effect with, with insurance and building and all sorts. Mm. It's uh, in increasingly unpredictable is mm. probably the best way of putting it. We, we know that uh, the terminology is unhelpful, calling it a one in 200 year event suggests it's going to come back every 200 years. Mm. It's a 2% event. And if you start thinking about it like that, the, the percentage chances increased. Uh, so, so now we've got a, an opportunity where we're modeling uh, floods based on very sparse data, and we need more data to fill in those known data points. Uh, and that's what we can actually help with, is providing calibration data for those flood models alongside that reactive information for when it's actually flooding. So how have you set the network up? What, what, what technology are, are you using to, you know, to, to create these sensors and to communicate the data back? So we built the hardware all from uh, off-the-shelf parts, but built uh, PCBs, and uh, it's been an interesting process uh, doing hardware, not something that I would want to spend my life doing. Uh, but it's uh, taking ISM band low power radios. Uh, the in original incarnation was sending it over uh, short range back to a gateway that's attached to people's broadband. Mm -hmm. So that was the community aspect. But that's harder to sell to uh, somebody who's buying a network. So LoRaWAN then seemed to be the right technology at the right time to do that. We did experiment with TV white space, and we're certainly using that for backhaul to reach uh, rural areas. Um, and we've actually run one of the uh, Ofcom trials for that, so it's still operational. It's still showing us how alternative technologies will help us. But LoRaWAN is the one that we've chosen for now, and we're making it compatible with the Things Network, which is an open LoRaWAN network, which means uh, if you have one in your area already, you just need to buy the sensor, not the, the package. So what kind of coverage have you got at the moment? Are, are, you, are you based uh, purely in the Oxford area? So we've got our first installation was completely in Oxford. It was started as the Oxford Flood Network. Um, we've sold individual sensors to interested hobbyist kind of uh, level of people around the country and sort of perfected that onboarding process and some of the troubleshooting. So we've got uh, Isle of Wight, we've got um, Dorset, uh, Calderdale, which is Hebden Bridge where some of the floods are. Uh, we've got um, some plans to expand in Hebden Bridge and the Calder Valley, which is very flashy. You can't see the water coming until it's almost too late. So you need warning upstream and it's just not economical to put in uh, with existing measures. Uh, we've also got a pilot poised to go in uh, Lancashire, uh, and we're looking at other local authorities. So what's the interest been f uh, like from local authorities, and, and, and obviously see the benefits of, of this, and you know, how do they sort of finance the model, because you often hear the local authorities struggling with any kind of spending at the moment. Yes, the local authorities are quite complex because they're the ones you would expect to be doing the work and have the funding for flooding aren't necessarily the ones that do. So a, a lead local flood authority is a definition that's often given to uh, a, uh, a county council, whereas the city council might be the ones doing some of the work on the ground. Uh, finding the, f the, the funding tends to be uh, aiming it at reducing the risk uh, improving the operational efficiency. So if you're looking for a flood, 
the first thing you don't want to do is send someone out in the dark to look for a flood. Uh, you need to see that remotely, then mobilize your staff. There's the uh, barriers, the sandbags, the pumps, uh, and the road closure signs, they're in the stores over there. Over there is where the flood is, that's where the traffic jam is. You become part of the traffic jam and chaos ensues. If you can get ahead of that by a few hours, uh, um, inform the media, tell the media that that, tell the public that road is closed, then you've got some chance of heading off that problem and you know, uh, starting to be more resilient when these things happen. And what about the, the collection of, of, of data? You know, the data comes back in there. How, how easy or, or, or challenging is it for the right authorities to interpret that data and then act on it? It's usually uh, based on local knowledge. So there is, a, there is a threshold that you can set beyond which you know that this is going to cause a problem. Uh, there are uh, trash screen monitors. So if you have um, a culvert that goes under, say, a car park or a road or a town, there will be a grill in front of it called a trash screen. And that collects debris so it doesn't go through the culvert and block. If you've got a differential in height of the water levels upstream to downstream, you know it's blocked and then you can take action. Whereas up to now, you have to go around looking for it. Uh, authorities been able to, I guess, interpret the data. And, and you know, you've got that data stream coming in. How, how are they actually interpreting it? Uh, some of the data is used as raw data. So that's actually as threshold crossings. So you set the threshold, you know when it's past that point to alert a group of people. Um, interpreting the data over time, you can see the, the history. You can see it uh, as the uh, storms pass uh, in Oxford, a few days later, it starts to respond, uh, whereas somewhere like Calderdale it will respond immediately. Uh, so you need to know what your local conditions are and how to respond to that. If you combine that with uh, the, the Environment Agency's data, it kind of fills in those gaps where you can't see what's happening. When you started out, did you have this, this clear idea of, you know, there's the sensors, it's going to create the data, it's going to come back, it's going to get analysed, processed, authorities are going to act on it, um, there's going to be a successful outcome. Um, is, is, is that changing? Because we talk about open data and opening data up and selling data, not selling data, but making data available to, to other people. Um, is there interest in that? Is there interest in third parties who maybe you weren't aware of when you, when you started um, the Flood Network saying, actually, we'd like to use that data for another application? Yes. Uh, the To separate open data from third-party reuse of data is quite important. So the open data equation is someone pays for the collection, then they own it, then they provide a service, then they open it up for you to also try something based on it. If you're generating the data and you're pre presenting it as open data, there is no business model there. You have to find the generation of the data, someone to pay for that generation, and then if you want to open that as a result, then that's fine. Um, the third parties using the data, that's definitely important to us. So where with M2M, you install a sensor, it does a job, it texts you when something happens, that's it. With IoT, what you're doing is even taking the same M2M telemetry system, but then plugging it into a wider ecosystem of potential customers. Uh, for example, uh, the example I like to use is, is uh, the dam, if you own a dam, imagine you owned a, uh, a reservoir and a dam somewhere, you know that the rainfall is coming. Now if you know how heavily it's rained, where the water is at a certain point, you know how much water you'll have in your dam for water supplies. You'll also know your hydroelectric power potential, which also gives you a position on the electricity market. So you now know your value in two weeks time on the electricity market is that much better because you've got that potential energy. At the same time, you only installed it for emergency response. Mm. So the, the customer may not be the one who installs it. The challenge is finding the way of bridging that gap between two completely separate sectors and actually knowing that you can justify that infrastructure. Building on that use of data, um, when you started, you mentioned about using crowdsourcing of, of the data. Um, is that a viable model for other IoT startups to, to adopt and one they perhaps you should, you're recommending they should be looking at? Crowdsourcing, if you're installing the hardware, is somewhat 
complicated that if somebody has paid for an installation, say a local authority, the chances of them installing it in individuals' homes are slim until this model perhaps gains in popularity. Individuals installing one at a time, then you have to produce a lot of hardware. Uh, if you can get the data as a byproduct of something else, that's I think where it becomes really powerful. So the crowdsourcing of temperature data by installing flood sensors, which happen to have a temperature sensor on them, uh, then can contribute to something else such as uh, weather observations. And it's not necessarily a, a, a I think this is always the, the, the problem with the Internet of Things, is everyone looks at it as this monolithic stack value chain. Here's the application, here's the hardware. You can break those apart now, and you can start to supply them separately under a different uh, terms to different people and still use the data that comes out of them. Ben, fascinating business. Uh, good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.